Good morning, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to day two of the Cal OER conference. We are very happy to have you joining us today. This morning's system update session will include representatives from California's three segments of public higher education, the California Community Colleges, the California State University, and the University of California. They will provide updates on their systems OER, zero textbook costs, and textbook affordability efforts. New funding, legislation, and state goals will be addressed as appropriate. And time will be allotted for questions and answers towards the end. We have organizing committee members available if you would rather add your questions to the chat, and we'll collect them there as well. And with that, if we're all ready, I'll go ahead and uh, pass it over to our first presenter. We have Rebecca Rowan O'Shaughnessy to divulge in the newest information out of the community college system. So let me stop my share. Thank you, Nicole. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we actually have quite a bit of development from our system uh, to scale OER, to strengthen instructional material affordability and improve learning. So I appreciate this opportunity today to be here with you. Uh, next slide, please. This is a slide that highlights the uniqueness of our governance structure within our system. We currently serve 1.8 million students every year. We do so through our 116 colleges across the state, organized into 73 districts with locally elected board of trustees. The chancellor's office at the state level is governed by our own board of governors. So um, to the maximum degree permissible, we're also directed to maintain and continue local autonomy and control in the administration of the community colleges. So in short, uh, in order to move anything systemic in our system and turn those uh, actions into, uh, translate that into real benefits for our students, it will take uh, a lot of various, uh, it will take various factors and actors at the state level and locally to make comprehensive changes. Uh, next slide, please. Big news for our system. In June, we welcomed our new permanent system chancellor, Chancellor Sonia Christian. Two months onto this job, she's already setting an ambitious and actionable fact, uh, fr uh, framework for our system. So Vision 2030 is not a new vision, it's a framework, right? So it's guided by the vision for success many of you are familiar with, which is our North Star. And then the governor's roadmap, I believe they are university compacts for our partner segments. And so it goes deeper, right? Vision 2030 goes deeper into the how. Next slide, please. For those of you who are from our system, the chancellor has provided updates to Vision 23 during consultation council, the board of governors meeting and system webinar among other uh, convenings. This information is also available on our website for your feedback and thoughts. These are goals, strategic directions and action items. And ZTC OER and student access to instructional materials free of burden touch on many of the Vision 2030 priorities. Next slide, please. And I, before I start, right, our system and really all of you here have been working on this for a long time, reducing costs of instructional materials, strengthen student financial stability, minimize the financial, administrative, and psychological burdens associated with students getting what they need before they begin a class. Our board of president called this unrecognized philanthropy during our last meeting. So I wanna recognize that and say thank you for all of your efforts. And it is time and our system is ready to harness all this energy and put wind in your sails map out the enabling conditions at the state level and the local level to coordinate, accelerate, and scale your work. And go even bolder beyond OER, beyond ZTC even, right? To set up goals at ensuring student equitable and timely access of instructional materials, which are textbooks, supplemental materials, and supplies before classes start. And our inspiration comes from the why here, right? Comes from our students come from the recognition that when a student has to shoulder the financial burden of cost, administrative burden of trying to secure instructional materials one way or the other, and the psychological burden such as stress and anxiety, 
their educational quality and outcomes suffer significantly. And as open access institution, it's our imperative to remove these burdens for our students. Next slide, please. So when we talk about this work, we're approaching it using an act, learn, change cycle. So act are the things that we need to move with urgency. You see the ZTC degree program and the technical assistance there. Learn is really the infrastructure that we begin to build and continue to perfect that help us evaluate impact and engage in continuous improvement. We know we only have one-time investment on ZTC. So how do we make sure right, we can maximize the impact, ensuring sustainability with this one-time investment, and at the same time, continue to understand the landscape and the progress of our system and advocate for ongoing investment uh, for this effort for our students. And then the last bit is change, which are enabling conditions that really accelerate action, ensure sustainability and maximize impact. Next slide, please. So I'm going into kind of the nuts and bolts of our ZTC program, right? The ZTC grant program is $115 million. So it's a historic one-time investment into our system to support the development and implementation of ZTC degree and certificate programs. The legislative intent for this funding is clear, reducing costs and decreasing time to completion. So the statute also emphasized the importance of non-duplication and programs resulting in greatest number of degrees benefiting the greatest amount of students. So we're really clear with the, le with the legislation, right? This investment, we want to see impact on our students in a tangible way, and we wanna maximize that impact. Next slide, please. So here are some key dates for the ZTC degree program. The Chancellor's Office is taking a phased approach to facilitate really the two goals. One is building a foundational ZTC capability system-wide and also to accelerate the development of ZTC degree programs uh, by colleges or early adopters of ZTC strategies. To that end, we have provided $200,000 to each college. So the first two uh, boxes there, uh, the planning grant and the implementation grant totaling $200,000 to each college. In return, we're expecting each college to develop at least one program. So that speaks to our fundamental uh, capability across our system, right? Uh, it is important that every college begins to plan and think about what it means to engage in ZTC strategy, right? This is not optional from our perspective because our students, every student in our system, deserve to have, have the opportunity to benefit from this great uh, movement that we are creating. What's coming though very soon is the, uh, the acceleration grant um, where we want to provide support to and invest in the colleges that are interested in building on the existing local efforts and accelerate and scale the work and develop more programs by fall 2026. By the end of this grant, we're anticipating more than 550 programs developed by our students, uh, developed for our students. And that means a reasonable amount of ZTC sessions will be available for our students to obtain their degrees or certificates. Next slide, please. So here comes the timeline for the acceleration grant. We have a few office hours. We have already had a few office hours on this. So we're very excited to be releasing a streamlined program plan to the system by August 15th. And I want to make it sure uh, make sure that everyone knows that it's not a competitive grant. You can see from the readiness prompts on the right, we want to give opportunities to as many colleges, as many programs as possible, as long as there's a willingness and there's feasibility to develop ZTC programs by fall 2026. Because we do have to submit a legislative report evaluating the impact of this program in 2027. So we encourage all colleges to consider applying for the acceleration grant. If you have any specific questions, please contact my ZTC colleagues. Uh, I will provide our ZTC uh, email address uh, after uh, my uh, portion of the, the presentation. One thing I want to emphasize is please, please, please don't count yourself out because of some perceived constraints. 
We know some of you might have local shared governance procedural constraints that make it difficult for you to turn something around and finalize something in one month. Some of you might even be uh, less further along, right? You might be very interested but need support to fill out the program plan. I just wanna ensure you that we have included these considerations in our program plan and we wanna help. We have included these, uh, uh, so, so again, please uh, submit the program plan, right? Uh, we want to help and our students need ZTC programs. So we'll start making grant awards in September, then allocate dollars out to the grantees in October. Um, as all regular, uh, as all other uh, grant programs, right? we'll be asking for progress report and final report. One thing I do want to note um, from the previous slide, you already see there was implementation grant, there was a you know, planning grant, there is acceleration grant, there are a lot of different grants, right? But what we want to do, right? So they all are different in the beginning, right? Because the nature of the, the grants, subgrants are different. But as we move into the progress report and final reports, those are going to be very, very, uh, they, they are essentially going to be the same, right? Because a grant is a grant to develop a program. So we want to see where you are. And again, we really want to move beyond the compliance piece. It's really not about compliance um, in the uh, during the grant uh, period, what we want to do is really understand what you need in terms of professional development, and we want to deploy that level of differentiated support to you uh, to ensure the success of the development and implementation of your programs on campus. Next slide, please. Uh, many of you have told us over and over again, and we agree that OER has to be a primary strategy to accomplish ZTC and burden-free instructional materials because it's the most sustainable and cost-effective way to accomplish this key priority. But we also know that these are places where OER, they are places where OER is not feasible, and that's why we need comprehensive solutions. But OER needs to be the starting place for that conversation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is really, uh, and I talked over and over again, right? We're here to support you. We want to help. So this is what we have right now in terms of professional development plan, right? We want to provide really a differentiated types of um, support as well. So it really ranges from individual coaching to centralized support to facilitated courses to a broader uh, audience and then to the community practice, right? We want to uh, put together to really uh, in, uh, to really encourage the sharing of best, best practices, and we want to uh, really um, highlight the uh, the plan to partner closely uh, with the AS Triple C OERI, right? Because they have done tremendous amount of work for a very very long time in in the OER, in scaling OER, and supporting faculty. So we really want to uh, really want to. You know, right, harness the energy and really want to align and leverage the efforts there. So then we are not creating duplicating services, but really much more supplementing and reinforcing all the technical assistance there available across our system. Uh, next slide, please. So um, if you recall, learn, at, uh, act, learn, change, right? So this is really the learn piece. What about, uh, this is kind of what we are envisioning as a kind of the skeleton of our evaluation and continuous improvement structure. We have the XB12, which is the system level, right? Data, data element that we're collecting to understand where we are. And um, it's not perfect. So we are continuing to work with our partners to make improvement to the data, data element. And then we also sent out an informal readiness assessment, which was a self-reported tool for colleges to just under, to kind of have a self, uh, have, um, to let us know, right, where where they how they feel in terms of their readiness in implementing ZTC programs, and from there we get a better understanding in terms of the professional development that's needed for the colleges and for the system. And then, as I mentioned prior, we have a program progress report. We're also um, contracting with the RP group to really conduct program evaluation at the end of the program. And then we we can't do this without all the local data that's that's already happening right locally. And we wanna to continue to support that and coordinate the effort there. Next slide, please. So this is a really, really fun uh, project that, that's ongoing, right? So in January, 
uh, of this year, we launched the burden-free instructional materials task force. And as you can see, uh, the photo really shows uh, some of the representatives that were there in person. Uh, but really, uh, I want to highlight is the tremendous energy and partnership uh, that was part of the task force. And, and everyone really worked together coming from different perspectives. We have CBOs, we have ASCCC, we have our student senate, we have our other faculty and, and other um, librarians and other expertise and CSSOs across the, our system to provide the support, uh, to provide feedback and understanding, you know, um, how do we uh, look at system-wide uh, burden-free instructional materials. So it's not just the OER efforts, obviously OER efforts, efforts scaling and accelerating that race to the top because of, because of its, um, its ability to sustain, right? Burden-free priorities across a system. But then we also venture into supplies, which really implicate the, ZT, uh, the CTE world uh, significantly. So there was a broad conversation across different aspects of burden-free instructional materials. And from there, uh, we came, uh, the, the task force came up with uh, some um, very comprehensive comp uh, recommendations in terms of how the system needs to move forward. Um, next slide, please. So here are some of those. Uh, so this is a task force charge, right? Again, go back to the why. We really want to focus on right, student experience and what that means for administrative, financial, and psychological burdens that students have to shoulder, right? To really um, to even get what they need before class starts. So the task force charge really are four things, right? So there's some baseline recommendations on policies and regulations because we know systems change will require some of those structural changes. And then also, um, how do we think about resources to support ZTC efforts? And then also OER, infrastructure, a lot of states, uh, coordination and direct support. And then also, how do we support local work, right? Because we know uh, campus efforts to adopt ZTC is critical. So how do we think about system level enabling conditions to move it forward? Um, next slide, please. So here are some high level key recommendations and we are still finalizing the recommendation report and hopefully we'll be able to share with all of you once the uh, very soon once the report is finalized. So there, the, there are a few things, right? One is about system level commitments and local goals. So we have to make sure, right? Burden-free instructional material is part of the system commitment and it, it is. We just passed a board resolution declaring that system commitment. We'll start to embed specific ZTC and burden-free actions in, the, in Chancellor's Vision 2030. And we also know, as I mentioned, it's important to understand the local realities and also support right local campus and local district to set their uh, instructional material goals. And then it, we're very clear that setting goals alone is not enough, right? There needs to be additional um, resources and other enabling conditions that needs to be highlighted so we understand what needs to happen to support local campus to achieve those goals. And then we will conduct also a regulation review to really understand uh, understand the barriers we have currently in, in place that, that prohibit students in making their free choices or that are creating friction points. And then uh, from a funding perspective and from eligibility perspective. So what we're doing is really proposing a comprehensive regulation review there. And then we understand to, to in order to do continuous improvement, we need the data infrastructure, right? What we have right now is helpful, but it's insufficient. So we have to understand what the, what the need is, right? To strengthen that data infrastructure, both system-wide and locally, and also understand what resources uh, they are required to accomplish this goal, right? Data infrastructure is not cheap. So calling those things out and putting price tags on these things will help us uh, move forward, right? Taking, action uh, uh, taking actions immediately and move things forward. And scale OER, I think it's no question here, um, PD, technology and system level uh, coordination, right? Uh, the recommendation, uh, the task force recommended a lot of things around, you know, UDL, around licensing, around accessibility. So all these are the things that are top of the task force's mind. And we certainly build that into the recommendation as we think about implementation. 
And then expense system level procurement, which was a big aha for the task force, right? When we think about supplies, you know, there's actually a, a huge opportunity for the chancellor's office to engage our partner over at the Foundation for California Community Colleges called College Buys, which is really thinking about system level procurement for some of those supplies. So we just need to kind of understand what the criteria is to identify these top priority items for that level of uh, system uh, procurement that can really alleviate the financial burdens of uh, some of our uh, our districts so then they can free up the resources to to um, uh, to focus on other um, strategies that can support instructional material efforts on campus. And then, like I said, right, price tag is important, right? Nothing is free. So how do we think about, you know, joint advocacy for additional ongoing investment for this effort, right? Even and OER, despite the fact that OER is the most sustainable option, OER needs ongoing funding to support and to maintain. So we are uh, aware of that. So that task force is aware of that. So there's uh, recommendations in these kind of key areas. So very excited to share this with you. And um, I hope you all keep your eyes peeled when we uh, finalize that report and, and, and share that with the public. Next slide, please. So I touched on this a little bit earlier. So in July, so just a couple of weeks ago, um, the Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges passed a resolution declaring these really three things. One is prioritizing the reduction and elimination of instructional material costs and alleviate student burdens. So it's really clear that it's beyond OER, but OER has to be a key part of it, but it's very clear that we want to ground our declaration on student experience. So we want to, we want the endpoint to be low or no instructional material costs for our students and also important piece is alleviating student burdens, right? Because right now some students can get to low cost instructional materials, but they have to jump through a lot of administrative hoops to get there. So we're recognizing that as well. And we, we need to address that. And then as I mentioned, as I highlighted, there were six key task force recommendations. So the chancellor's office will work with our uh, statewide uh, uh, partners and the task force members to understand and to also develop an implementation plan uh, for those recommendations. And the last bit um, is really uh, one of those tangible action steps that the, core, uh, the, the board has directed the chancellor's office to work with partners on, which is to provide recommendations to ensure sustainable, no-cost textbook solutions for general education courses, right? That's very much it's different, but it's very much aligned with um, the ZTC uh, legislative intent. If you think about the intent around maximizing uh, degrees and, and maximizing the benefits to students, and we can see really the great benefit of general education courses and the costs associated with that. And if we can uh, make those courses lower no textbooks across the board, that will make a significant gain in student affordability for, for our entire system. So we're very excited about that. And again, OER has to be part of this when we think about sustainable solutions. So that wraps up my portion of the presentation. I'm going to turn it over uh, back to Nicole. Thank you so much for that great start to our session today. Next, we'd like to welcome Leslie Kennedy. Uh, she's be discussing the California State University system updates. Take it Hello, away. everybody. And uh, thank you so much, Nicole. Just trying to find my PowerPoint in the share screen options. <laughs> it's not showing up. Um, got too many windows open. Anyway, let me just um, say that to introduce myself, I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor of uh, Academic Technology Services at the CSU and uh, have been in uh, working with affordable learning solutions in the CSU since 2014. Um, I've had the pleasure of being able to support our, our 23 universities with that um, for quite a while, almost over 10 years now. So, all right, so I found my PowerPoint. Let me see if I can get a present option here. I've just been coming off of a, um, um, can you hear me? Because it looks like everything's frozen. We can hear you, but we are missing your PowerPoint. 
Oh, it's strange because it says you are screen sharing. Okay, so some reason, Mike, I think my computer is frozen. So um, why don't I just talk and uh, see if, if things become unfrozen. So I've been chairing a committee this morning um, for another assistant vice chancellor position and have lots of uh, windows open and maybe my computer is not handling all this. Uh, unfortunately, it's getting old. Um, so we have a four-year process of renewals. Probably you all do too, so you probably can relate to that. So I think the, the PowerPoint is up now. So um, the emphasis in the CSU, uh, which had just celebrated affordable learning solutions activities uh, for 25 years in this past year. And so what we've been focused on is uh, the principles of choice for faculty and students, access for all students, and of course, affordability. Those are the main principles of the affordable learning solutions. And uh, our goal is very similar to the community colleges and the UCs is that all our students have access to the course materials um, as much as possible and as quickly as possible. So with the Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative, we've been providing grants and resources to the campuses that they apply for um, to help uh, um, engage faculty in, uh, in learning more about adopting zero cost or low cost materials. And uh, every campus has selected a department coordinator to manage that and um, to also provide the reporting activities back to the chancellor's office. And we have a, a team of affordable learning solutions folks involved in that. Some of them are on the, on the Zoom call right now. We also are very grateful to work closely with the community colleges and the UCs uh, with either sharing resources or sharing um, support in regards to um, legislative activities or or anything else that we all need to do to work at, together to support our the state of California. And that is a, a very enjoyable experience. We meet regularly and uh, and that's this conference is a result of that. Um, another aspect that we've shared uh, recently from the community colleges and the uh, some of the OER efforts that you all have been engaging in is uh, we, of course, we all share a lot of similar curriculum and it, uh, some of your folks have created um, OER textbooks for uh, the ethnic studies courses that we are we are beginning to teach or have been teaching based on the requirements of the state and um, we share the similar outcomes and those OER textbooks for ethnic studies have been shared uh, amongst the 23 campuses and uh, have been adopted in various ways and so that's another great example of our partnership in working together. But just a little bit more about the CSU. Um, over the last few years, where we've been tracking savings, um, you know, savings it continues to increase. This is the 2021 number. We just got the numbers for 21, 22, and they have not been compiled uh, into this kind of a format. But you can see that um, that uh, various uh, initiatives, including the bookstores, are included in these savings that are that we post. And um, so they continue to increase. And uh, as we are uh, moving forward, we're seeing a need to meet a goal based on Governor Newsom's compact with the California State University, which came out last year, in addition to our budget. And in the compact, which had many different goals for the CSU, um, one of the goals was to make course uh, material affordable to reach the savings of 150 million for course materials for the CSU by 2025. So uh, one of the activities that we've done to help our campuses understand what that may look like and how they could assist in getting us to that goal is uh, to break down the uh, um, suggested savings for our campuses. And you can see our 23 universities here and, um, and the suggested goals based on FTE and a, um, uh, a formula that we have, uh, I can share with you on the next slide if you're interested. Uh, but um, if the CSU reaches this compact goal, which as I, as I said, has multiple criteria in it, and this is just one of them, then the legislator or Governor Newsom's office will increase our um, budget, overall uh, uh, budget to an, another 5%. And then we will, uh, um, that would be about 225 million in our base budget. So it's a, a very important goal. 
and we're excited about it. And uh, and but it's quite challenging to be able to recognize this type of savings on every campus. So we believe. Um, well, let me just move on a little faster here. Uh, this is our our formula, where, which where we re um, got to those numbers that I just showed you previously. We based it on FTE and then also the three hundred fifteen dollars per student FTE for materials, course materials, and we have different um, explanations about that. This is the measurement of savings. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But um, the strategies to meet these compact goals are to continue to help faculty recognize and, and adopt uh, zero cost course materials. We partner closely with our libraries. And, um, and so there are quite a few ebooks, e-textbooks and scholarly materials available there. And then also uh, uh, um, the continued adoption of OER, utilizing the resources that we've developed based on a intersegmental funding project called uh, from several years ago, Assembly Bill 928. And that was the coolfored.org or .edu.org, can't remember, cool for, cool for ed. A website where we're collecting and showcasing faculty adoption of OER and then also faculty um, uh, recommended materials. And I believe the community colleges are also actively utilizing cool for ed.org. And what we do is we do interact with um, Michelle Pilati and the team to make sure that we maintain the cool for ed.org site um, for, in regards to adoptions. So that's one of the strategies is to focus on helping faculty uh, connect and adopt zero cost course materials. And then as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, the um, there's a focus of OER for gen ed materials or GE level materials. Um, within the CSU, we teach a breadth, a huge breadth of courses and um, there isn't OER available for all of them. So then we encourage low cost course materials programs co coordinated through our campus bookstores. So we meet with our stores regularly. We're in partnership with them. They have, are running those in, uh, inclusive access programs to help reduce the cost of a textbook um, 60 to 80%. So that savings is also assisting our students um, in avoiding paying full price for those course materials that the faculty are choosing. Because remember, one of our principles in, is, is choice based on the academic freedom of selection of materials within the CSU. So low cost course materials are a very important aspect of our savings. Um, so when we ask for folks to consider supporting affordable learning solutions, we ask them to on their campuses to learn who their affordable learning solutions coordinator is. We have some gaps right now on some of our campuses. We also ask them to apply for funding. And um, so um, we have some uh, funding opportunities, as I mentioned earlier. We require participating in annual faculty recognition ceremonies. And we also uh, highlight other equitable access options for our students. So equitable access means um, access to their materials on the first day of class, um, whether they're zero cost or whether they're low cost. And again, zero cost is the best option because um, that is the way um, to help students the most. But again, that is not always an option within our system. So we have to also work with the other options and try to lower costs as much as possible. So we um, taking action is to apply on an annual basis with a for affordable learning solutions funding. We have a template for that. And then there's a whole process uh, that um, go the campuses go through. Uh, the, the limits for campus to apply for is 15 to $20,000 which is not a whole lot for campus to um, manage a, a, um, the, a large initiative on their with multiple faculty on their campuses, but that's our parameters in which we have to work. So that's how that is um, uh, coordinated and implemented within the CSU. And um, here's just a uh, indication of our uh, estimated course savings within the CSU around zero cost materials. So we have, you can see some campuses are, um, are more active, more, some faculty are more active than others. And you can see that we have some other areas where we have a lot of work to do. Um, so 
um, this is an ongoing strategy that's been in place, as I said earlier, for a while. And uh, we continue to work hard in the CSU um, to encourage more and more zero cost course savings. So that's really my overview and in, of what's happening in the CSU. And uh, again, we really appreciate working and collaborating with our community college and UC faculty and uh, leadership around affordable course materials. And, um, and uh, I thank you very much for having the time to, to share what we're doing. And uh, I look forward to the rest of the presentation. So I'll turn it back over to you. I think it's Connie. Sorry, I missed that at the beginning. Thanks, Leslie. Appreciate wonderful update there. Um, we're going to top off our session with Sarah Fai and Delmar Larson to discuss the University of California system update. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Um, what we have to share from the University of California is nowhere near as impressive as what our um, California colleagues are doing at the system levels. Um, I'll be sharing a little bit about our newest uh, system level efforts in the University of California. Um, and then my colleague Delmar Larson will share the kind of more grassroots efforts that we have going on, which luckily are a little bit more uh, substantial, um, but on a more individual uh, campus level basis. So um, we recently in the University of California convened a task force. Um, we were charged with kind of setting some principles that should guide how the University of California considers OER initiatives, uh, inventorying what we're already doing, looking for exemplars out there, many of which we've looked to our um, California colleagues, exploring the technical needs um, for a multi-campus initiative, of course, getting our faculty feedback on the barriers and what incentives would be needed uh, to do kind of a scalable implementation, getting student feedback, and then kind of developing a proposed plan and budget for a system-wide initiative. We kicked off this work in August of 2020. Uh, two, and we completed it in just under four and a half months. So a really quick sprint to kind of bring some folks across the system together. Um, here was our task force membership. Uh, this was a delightful group to lead because we had a really nice cross-sectional representation of our faculty, our folks from the library, staff, um, students who were uh, staff who were thinking about student success, staff who were thinking about supporting faculty in their teaching development. Um, folks working in our bookstores. We had both um, folks who were really new to thinking about OER and just getting familiar with the terminology. And we had seasoned experts such as Delmar on the team. So it was a great group to lead. Um, we started with just kind of understanding the landscape. Not surprisingly, the University of California system is not immune uh, to the cost of books impacting our students. Uh, this is some results from our UC system-wide undergraduate experience survey which shows that uh, we asked the students if they've ever bought fewer textbooks, cheaper textbooks, or read books on reserved. And you can see the vast majority of our students have done that um, and continues to be um, a large fraction of our students uh, not buying the textbooks for their classes um, or trying to find alternatives. One of the things that really resonated with our faculty was the impact of OER and the ability to kind of be more flexible with the instruction. So it wasn't just about the student and the cost, but also this flexibility really was something that our faculty resonated with and um, thought was of interest. And then finally, the research around the incremental impact for underrepresented students, Pell eligible students and first generation students. A lot of this sort of research showing the benefits of OER was something that really motivated um, our faculty and our system-wide conversations. Um, a few of the background pieces that our um, task force gathered to start with was an inventory of what activity was already going on on the UC campuses, which we were delighted to find most campuses had some level of OER activity, some more organized than others. And just as a part of the committee conversations, there was already folks, can I borrow that? Can I use your resource there? So I think we've already jump-started some conversations across the system and sharing what was going on. We really investigated some exemplars. Um, we brought in some folks for consultation to learn more about what they had done within their systems. The University of Georgia system was one that was a particularly um, resonant example for our group. Um, we connected with all of the campus academic senates um, and various committees there to get their input um, and suggestions to guide the work. And then finally, we really just looked at some of the options for 
what are the platforms that are available? Where can we host things, et cetera? Um, and finally, our kind of outcome of the task force's work was a recommendation of a three-tier model for looking at a system-wide OER initiative. We recommended kind of an adoption adaption uh, phase. This was really almost a marketing campaign um, to our faculty, to our students, to um, the benefits of using open educational resources, the resources that are already out there, and the support and providing a robust support mechanism to help people adopt those resources. Um, tier two was really actually creating OER, uh, creating it in such a way that we have a strategy around which classes, which topics, and fostering collaboration amongst the campuses to develop resources that would be useful in multiple contexts. Um, one of the things we talked about was kind of where we thought the UC could add value to the content creation, knowing that there's already a lot of great lower division content being created by the California Community College effort, the CSU efforts and stuff. We were looking at, you know, maybe we want to focus on some upper division courses, some boutique classes where there were gaps in the um, ecosystem uh, of content that we needed. And then finally, um, tier three, we focused beyond the textbook, beyond the course materials into some of the other things that um, campuses need. It, that's the educational tools. So things like the homework systems, clicker systems. Um, we talked about developing and hosting our own educational tools because we found that there was really substantial student paid commercial systems beyond just kind of textbook course materials and opportunities to develop those at the system level to replace some of those costs for our students. So that was kind of the um, structure of our recommendations. Within those tiers, we recommended um, things such as having a faculty, a library, and a design champion from each campus, having a standing system-wide OER advisory committee, as I said before, messaging campaigns, micro grants to faculty, um, hosting a system-wide conference regularly to bring together uh, folks who are utilizing OER to share best practices, Tier two, we really focused on strategic prioritization of which content, um, what platforms we should be using. And my colleague will tell you more about LibreText and some of the efforts already underway there. Um, and then tier two expanded to some larger um, mid-size and larger grants to faculty. And then finally, we already have a system-wide structure for educational technology. Um, and so we proposed piggybacking on that group to prioritize and suggest where we should go, what our next steps should be. Um, so finally, kind of where is this at right now? We produced this report in the fall. Um, we presented it to our system-wide provost committee. We've been queued up now to, preser uh, to present it to the UC Board of Regents with the kind of an ask attached to it. Um, and we've also proposed the creation of a UC wide OER implementation task force to actually put some of this into action. And we're kind of just um, sitting and waiting for those next steps on this project at this point. Um, so thank you for your time. And I will hand it over to my colleague, Delmar Larson, who can tell you a little bit more about our grassroots activities and things we're actually doing as opposed to just thinking about doing in the future. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it was a beautiful overview of uh, what's going on at the institutional level in this UC system. And I'm gonna be discussing uh, just briefly some of the grassroots efforts, uh, largely focused around the, the Libre Text project. So <clears throat> uh, uh, Sarah touched upon this, uh, and this applies not just to the UC system, but there's a wide variety of campus specific initiatives and pilot projects that would fall within the U, uh, the OER infrastructure. That includes bookstore led programs, which uh, is a topic of discussion. Um, there are library led uh, efforts, there are faculty led efforts, and then there's uh, administrative led efforts, whether it happens to be at the system wide infrastructure uh, or uh, lower administrative units. But before I actually uh, talk about at least uh, the one grassroots efforts that I know the most about the Libre Text project, I want to talk about uh, funding uh, for projects in the UC system. So the California Education Learning Lab um, is a I believe it's a four-year-old uh, project uh, uh, out of the state's governor's office uh, in order to facilitate uh, advancing STEM education, and specifically advancing STEM education uh, involving technology. Um, representatives presented uh, yesterday's uh, OE, uh, Cal OER um, conference 
uh, you can look at the video uh, if you like in order to uh, access that. Um, but it is a valuable resource in order to tap into. Uh, it's not just for uh, UC faculty, uh, but it's also uh, funding both CSUs and the California Community College System. Uh, to date, they have 63 uh, funded projects, uh, 40 of which involves the UCs, uh, 83 involve community colleges and 54 using Cal State University systems. I'm not entirely sure how those numbers work out right, but I will figure that out uh, uh, soon. Uh, but the key point and what's important for this conversation is that the deliverables of all their projects are designated as openly licensed, whether they're OER, open source technology. Uh, and that provides a valuable uh, infrastructure in order to be uh, facilitating OER construction um, and um, all the benefits that come from that. Um, so the Libertex project is a grassroots project in contrast to uh, a top-down institutional-based project. It's been around for 15 years. Uh, I'm the founder and uh, current director of the project. Uh, and the reason that I emphasize this uh, within this context is that uh, many people, many faculty uh, shouldn't be uh, having any barriers in order to be able to get involved in building OER. Uh, more specifically, if your institution uh, or if you have any resistance in order to be able to get involved in OER, you can do so, even if it's at a small scale, and that could have uh, large scale impacts at some point or another, uh, which was the case um, in the Kim Wiki project, which is the precursor for the uh, Libertex project. So the, the infrastructure uh, that we've created is uh, surrounding um, a construction of a courseware uh, to facilitate the construction, curation, adoption, adaption of OER. So it's meant to be a comprehensive practitioner oriented uh, approach in order to be able to facilitate uh, OER uh, and its approach. Uh, it's run out of uh, UC Davis. Uh, we also have a not-for-profit organization off campus in order to get around bureaucratic issues associated with running things within a large university infrastructure. Uh, about six and a half percent of the total web traffic uh, comes from the state of California. Uh, we deliver somewhere in the order of 900,000 page views per day, uh, or 1.1 billion page views total. Um, and the California is the um, major component of that traffic. Uh, so that's somewhere in the order of about 85 million page views since 2008 when we were founded. And in California, that's centered around major metropolitan areas, especially around UC campuses. Um, uh, we save somewhere on the order of $850,000 annually uh, at UC Davis alone, and somewhere in the order of eight to $10 million uh, total. Because this is a grassroots effort, we don't have fine control over every single adoption, um, and hence our numbers have a hefty uncertainty associated with it. Uh, but irrespective of that, uh, it's clear that the Libertex project is used uh, extensively throughout the state, um, country, and the world. Uh, the reason that uh, this is important for this conversation is that it's a valuable resource for uh, anyone building OER or having a desire to distribute OER within the UC system and within the greater uh, intersegmental landscape in the state. Um, so the infrastructure that we've constructed for uh, pursuing these things is referred to as the Libreverse. And the Libreverse has a lot of technologies in order to facilitate that. Um, I went over some of them yesterday, uh, but there are only three of them I want to be able to emphasize here uh, because these are very valuable uh, resources that individuals that are building OER uh, uh, could take advantage of. Um, so one is our core libraries, where we have 15 independently operating wiki technologies that faculty can use in order to construct their textbooks. Uh, right now we have about 600,000 pages of OER content, so it's a valuable resource. In fact, it's the largest central repository of OER content on the internet today in order to make it so that when faculty are building OER, you can then capitalize on what other people have done. And the idea behind here is the sharing is caring model, uh, so once you've created something, other people can benefit from it, and a centralized approach, which is uh, uh, which was touched upon both uh, in the California Community College discussion and the CSU uh, discussion uh, here. Uh, we have a range of technologies in order to facilitate that, uh, uh, in order to facilitate accessibility review, auto attribution, remixer, and it's free for uh, people in order to capitalize on. It's a valuable resource that doesn't require investment, financial investment, in order to be able to use. 
The second one is the Commons and Conductor technology. This is a technology that is an OER design project management tool. And it's the only OER, a large scale OER project management tool that you can use in order to be able to facilitate building of your resources because organizing teams in order to be able to build the resources can be really quite messy if you don't have an infrastructure in order to facilitate that. Uh, <clears throat> and you can address that at common, you can visit that at commons.libertex.org. It's again, a free resource, it's open source. You can uh, go to it in order to make an account and run with it uh, right now. It's part of our commitment to the uh, OER landscape. Lastly, and I'll be talking about this uh, in more detail um, later on today, is the ADAPT homework system. So the ADAPT homework system was funded by the California Education Learning Lab uh, as a complementary infrastructure to, uh, to OER textbooks. Uh, those of us that are faculty here uh, uh, <clears throat> recognize that there is a need in order to have a homework infrastructure to complement the textbooks that are being created. However, building a homework infrastructure is really a time intensive process. And thanks to the California Education Learning Lab investment, uh, we are uh, able to provide this resource for you guys. It has 170,000 pages of, oh, sorry, 170,000 questions uh, that verified instructors can have access to. And I don't know any faculty member on any campus that would say no to having access to a massive question bank. It's growing and it's growing rapidly uh, because we have a wide range of people contributing to our resources. Uh, to the resource. And it's also a free homework platform. So not only is it a repository of content, you can actually use it as a mechanism in order to facilitate advanced um, uh, homework assessments uh, in a wide variety of fields. Uh, not just STEM, uh, but including math, uh, Spanish, economics, and a wide range of uh, approaches. And we have another four more years uh, in order to advance uh, the development of ADAPT from the California Education Learning Lab grant. Um, so this is going to be growing massively for you, and I strongly encourage uh, any faculty member uh, in order to take advantage of the ADAPT homework system either as a question bank or as a homework uh, platform. And again, I'll be discussing this in more detail uh, this afternoon. Um, so that grassroots infrastructure uh, complements a more uh, top-down administrative approaches that Sarah had mentioned, uh, or approaches that are uh, done uh, at the campus level or at the college level, or even at the department level. So it takes a... Um, a lot of people in order to be able to move this pro this sort of effort forward uh, and we're very excited in order to be able to capitalize on the infrastructure uh, that we have in place at the system um, um, so for that uh, you could take a look at a, a few of uh, the uh, uh, a few links to issues that uh, regard to these things um, and i thank you for your attention your attention and i'll hand it off to nicole Thank you so much, Delmar and Sarah. Uh, great recap of what's going on and what's to come in the UC system. Um, let me see that we've had a couple of questions addressed in the chat so far. So um, please go ahead. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, please raise your hand. We can get a cue going if you'd like to ask questions like that. Um, uh, I did have, uh, we did have a question that a lot of people were behind asking about um, alumni and giving back uh, to see how they could give to different systems. So I wonder if any of that, the, the CCCs or the CSUs have a specific OER or zero textbook, I guess, funnel for uh, donations. I, I saw that question and uh, it's a great idea. Um, I will investigate we wouldn't have a funnel at this at this time but it could be something we could put on as a goal for ourselves in the future so it's not a it's a great idea um and so we'll see so csu is not there yet i think the community college system is very much in the same boat um we would love to have additional support and at the same time, we would love these alumni to also support our effort in joint advocacy for uh, ongoing support for OER efforts, right, going into the future, because that's really how we can make impact for our students and for our system. Thank you. 
Um, there's one more question, and we had a couple of different task force um, mentioned in our reports today. So I, I don't know if Marissa, if you want to clarify if there's a specific system, but um, she's asking whether or not student involvement looked like when generating the task force um, list and report of recommendations for students involved. Yes, and that's for the, the UC task force. Thank you. Sure. So I'm happy to answer that one. Um, we did invite our associated students to supply representatives to the task force, but they declined. So instead, what we did is we did a variety of student consultations. Um, CalPRIG is an organization that's very um, active, and one of their initiatives had been around um, cost of course materials. Uh, so we consulted with them a number of times. We also, they did some um, survey work of students and provided some feedback back to us. We also consulted with the individual campus Senate committees on undergraduate education, most of which had student representation um, on them. And then we also leveraged existing surveys and stuff that the campuses have been doing with their students um, or some of the folks had access to kind of, um, we had one of our team members actually uh, supervise the associated students on their campus. So got a lot of uh, feedback input from them um, on the draft recommendations. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, Marissa. Yeah, um, thank you so much for answering my question. Um, is this report going to be made available to the public and to the student public for review? Uh, I don't know yet. We're uh, sharing it with the regents first, and I think um, we'll figure out from there what gets shared system wide. Got it. Thank you. Any additional questions at this time? All right, I think I gave a sufficient amount of pause. So thank you to all of our presenters for bringing you us the update this morning and uh, look forward to uh, enjoying the rest of the Cal OER conference today. Thank you all. Thank you, Nicole. So Lena, the program won't let me stop recording. Did somebody else record this? I'm pressing stop in all the different